Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.com, and boy, I am... You know, I say this every week. I know I get this. I, I, I do say this every week, but it's really true. We've got another great Hangout planned for you today. In fact, you guys aren't going to believe this. I don't want to hear anybody ever tell me ever again how astronomers spend too much money, because... I can tell you that based on what I've learned with all of the ways in which they use various spacecraft that we send up into space and the data that come off of those, as well as when things go wrong, like in the case of Kepler and uh, K2 or, or whatever, astronomers find a way to do more with, with what they've got than I have ever seen before. And so today what we're going to talk about is astronomers using the New Horizons uh, spacecraft that flew past Pluto last year have been uh, using that data to gather the light from distant galaxies. And we're going to talk about how they did that and what research they did and everything else. But I need to uh, first uh, uh, mention that these hangouts and these these future, these, um, these Astro Coffee hangouts are sponsored and by the American Astronautical Society Amer by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. They make this possible. And uh, with me, and let me pull up my guests here. My my uh, co-host, there she is. Where is she? There she is, Dr. Carol Christian. Hi, Carol. How are you? Hello. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. Okay. So why don't you give it? Just, we do this every week, but maybe you can give us a little summary of what these hangouts are supposed sure. to be for. Sure. And I'm really excited about this one because, as you said, um, it's an um, amazing imagination and using the New Horizons. Um, instrumentation, and then while it wanders off through the solar system doing some other jobs. So the, the point of the astronomy coffee hangouts is not to present a lecture series. You're not going to be lectured to um, and shown only PowerPoint slides. That's not the point. The point is for you to see how astronomers interact about their research with, with each other. And so what we do, many of us, is in our institutions, we often have coffee, um, either every day or once a week, and we chit chat about research. What are you doing? Blah, 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 and, and explain to each other what we're doing. And sometimes we have guests who are going to give us a lecture, but we want to sit down and talk to them over tea or coffee and say, okay, come on, tell me, how were you motivated to do this? pick away at the analysis and really have a give and take. So it's not a lecture it, and we ask questions because for example, I'm not an expert at distant galaxies and I wanna understand um, what my colleagues here have, have done. So the whole point is a informal chatty exchange, sometimes irreverent because we're inviting you into our coffee time to discuss this particular research with the researcher who did it? And I think that's very important. It's not just Tony and I reacting to how great we think it is. We want to hear it from the people who did the work. Excellent so welcome point. to Astronomy Coffee. That's right. So that excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up because we do want to share this with all. And there's, I don't know of any other place where you're going to be able to get direct access to researchers and astronomers who write a lot of their papers. And we're very excited to have you with us. So, uh, so, so there are, there are the main way for you to interact with us today. I'm streaming on three platforms today. I'm streaming on YouTube. I'm streaming on Periscope. And I'm streaming on uh, on Facebook. I'm looking at the live chat on YouTube because that's the most active. I've got too many things going on to look at anything else, but next week I'm going to have more help with that. But this week I'm just using the live chat on YouTube. And so I'm seeing a lot of people, Yurek, uh, is, is our, you're asking no stream on Twitch today. No, I've decided to do Periscope. I want to do a test on that and we'll see how it goes. I see John Suffle. You're here. It's good to see you back again, Blair. You're back. So it's good to see all you guys. And uh, I'm looking right at your chat and I will ask, I will make uh, your uh, comments and questions available to uh, our guests as we go along. And so with that, oh, no. let me. Oh, no. What? <laughs> oh, dear. What happened? <laughs> Okay. Well, I don't know if Tony can hear us. So, I'm no, um, I'm, can you hear me? We, now we can, but okay. we lost you there. And I was oh. going to pick up, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, I, yeah, it may be that you can't hear me, but the rest of the people could. So, um, joining me uh, today uh, is. Dr. Michael uh, Zemkov, he's the, an assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology and one of the authors on the paper that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, also joining me is um, 
I have a lot of button pushes to to go through here. Uh, is um, Chi Wing? She is a student and also at Rochester uh, Institute of Technology, and she is a second year PhD student. Hi, Chi. Welcome. It's good to see you. Okay. And, Hi, uh, Quick, quick uh, little note. Can you tilt your camera down just a little bit because you're low in the frame? If you could just tilt your camera down a little bit, that'd be great. Ah, much better. Thank you. Okay. So, um, all right. But And are you muted also? No. Oh, sorry. Hi. We should have said hi. Hi, and thanks for inviting us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay, good. At least we, I'm glad we can hear you. That's good. Um <laughs> So let's see. We're gonna let's get started with uh, with today. We have um, a paper out that I'm gonna let you guys describe for us, Michael. I think I'm gonna start with you. Um, but and I wanna f <laughs> I wanna know a lot of things about this research, but primarily how you discovered that you could use New Horizons data for this stuff. But before I do, why don't you give us a little summary of your research? Okay, sure. Um, so. What we basically did was notice that the New Horizons mission, so just to summarize the New Horizons mission, this was something launched in 2006 um, that, that a couple of years ago went by Pluto and did our first real reconnaissance of Pluto. Got some really amazing data, uh, had imaging instruments, some spectrometers, some dust counters, did some magnetometry experiments, all the usual planetary stuff. Uh, I would say a really resounding success for NASA. It's really impressive that we can send something to Pluto in 10 years and it still works when it gets there. And the fact is that, that to go all the way out there, you have to be going so quickly that, that the flyby period was only you know, a couple days long. Um, so, so I think it, it, a towering technological achievement. But um, anyway, uh, during these 10 years... Um, we kind of are, are, are sitting there with this sort of inert spacecraft going on its way out, but, but the New Horizons team said, well, we'd really rather be talking to it once in a while and checking that it can still get data and this sort of thing. So, uh, uh, so you're talking about using it while it was on its way to Pluto. Yep, that's right. So, so it left Earth in 2006 and, and, and was sleepy, but not quite asleep on its way out, I guess you could say. Um, and, and so they were taking checkout data, you know, a couple times a year for that 10 year period and doing some calibration work and just checking that things were, were working properly. And um, we uh, 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 basically the idea is that the uh, 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 these data are just kind of sitting there and NASA has a public data policy, which is that you have to publish your data in these planetary missions after some length of time. It's like a year after you took it's it. It's like an embargo, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so these data kind of got dumped onto this archive that exists and, and I think were largely ignored. Um, um, and so, you know, what we did was we, we rifled through the, the archive and this is work that, that she did was to figure out what data was there and if any of it was any good for what we actually wanted to do. Um, and lo and behold, some of it was pretty useful. So uh, uh, that was kind of the genesis of it. And, and, and the rest of it is kind of just analysis after you've figured out whether it's even possible or not. So the, the, this is data, I'm going to ask you what instrument here in a minute, but as, as Pluto's getting out to go on its way out, it took like nine years to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. They periodically would wake it up and do that. Is, that. is that what they would do? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. So they had, they had kind of check-ins, I guess you'd say, every so often. Okay. And they'd, they'd run the instruments and make sure things were working and look at different patches of the sky. And that data just didn't get thrown out. It went somewhere to an archive, yep. presumably, uh, yep. uh, where the rest of the New Horizons data went. And you guys decided you could do something with it. <laughs> like my dog is playing with my toy. Uh, <laughs> so what, um, what, uh, what, first of all, what instruments were you interested in, in doing this with? And what exactly did you do with the data? Well, so, uh, uh, like I mentioned, you know, uh, New Horizons has something like a dozen, I forget the exact number of instruments. The ones we were most interested in uh, were imaging instruments, uh, of which there are, are three, um, but, but really the most data was for just one of them, which was called the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, which they shortened to LORI. So I'll just call it LORI from here on yeah, out. Yeah, L-O-R-R-I, I think, right? You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And so Lori is kind of a broadband optical wavelength camera. So it's, it's roughly the same wavelengths we see with the human eye. Um, and, and basically what was happening was uh, uh, they were looking at a variety of different things, some, some galactic, a lot of planetary objects, so a lot of like uh, uh, planetesimal type objects, Neptune, things like that on the way out. Most of this, like I mentioned, was basically for calibration work. But, um, uh, you know, for us, what we're actually interested in is what is the, what is the summed light from all the galaxies in the universe? Um, so you can use something like Hubble, right? And you can go and you can look at the individual galaxies that are causing the emission. You can count them up. Um, and that gets you some, like, handle on how much matter there is in the universe, how much of it's in stars, this kind of thing. Um, but, but you can pose a question, which is what if there's stuff in between the galaxies that we really can't see that's not resolvable into little pinpricks very easily? Let's say that the, the universe is filled with stars, but they're very far apart and they're in between galaxies. Would you even be able to see that? And the answer is no, not in a Hubble image. So for as long as we've been doing cosmology, you know, about 100 years now, at least modern cosmology, um, there's this, this question you know, is there like a diffuse component to the optical background? That is, is there extra stuff in addition to the galaxies that we see? Okay, hang on. So you're talking about, we, you, we know there is a microwave background, uh, well, a microwave background uh, to the entire right. universe. You're asking the question, is it, is there an optical component to that? The, and, and, and that's right. And, and, and in fact, it's true. It is a fact that at every wavelength, there is an optical, there is a background light. So, you know, there's an X-ray background, there's a radio background. Um, it's all due to different, different stuff. So, so we could talk about it in, in, in the microwave case, it's due to this light left over from the big bang, basically. Um, in the optical case, it's basically that, uh, uh, stars and things like stars are, are emitting at wavelengths that we see with the human eye. So okay, good. because um, there's no way if the, if the cosmic microwave background is, if we understand what, what it, what it is, a right. remnant of the uh, big bang itself, then that is red shifted light. That is light that has been red shifted from that event into the microwave region of the spectrum but you're looking in the optical, so it can't be related to that, right? That's right. That's right. So, so really, what it is is it's the light from all the galaxies in the universe. Okay. And we're not we're not resolving them out and making little little kind of pictures like Hubble does of them. What we're doing is we're kind of saying, okay, we're just going to count all the light, all the light particles, all the photons from that. Okay. I'm trying, um. Well, okay. Um, I want to get Chi into this in just a minute, but I want to I, I want to make sure I understand what we're talking about. The <laughs> So what would that look like? So you use Lori on its way to Pluto when it periodically did uh, calibration runs to make sure that, that the camera worked to try and see this diffuse optical, that's important, optical fog, I guess, in between the galaxies as it went to Pluto. You got it. That's exactly it. And so, so to this question of what does the data look like, if you go to the figure that is like the blue squares. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so those are the, those are the data sets we were working with. And these are not processed. These are kind of raw as they come out of the archive. Um, so, so, you know, the question is like, what are we actually looking for if we're not looking for little pictures of galaxies? And, and the answer is, if you look real careful at those blue squares, the, the bottom two have big sort of hexagonal saturated looking things. That's, that's Neptune. Um, and and we, we we mask Neptune out. We're not interested in the planet. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the rest of them, like if you look in the upper right, let's say that's that's got a lot of stars in it. So stars look like little red dots. The field two, the one labeled field two. You got it, field yeah. two. Um, ah, and so okay. we don't care about those either. We want to get rid of that. So if you actually ask what we're really looking at, what we're really looking at is what is the brightness level of all the blue stuff that's in between all the stars and, and all the other junk that you see in there. Um, so, so the whole name of the game is how bright is that light? Because that light, if you're doing things right, is not due to anything in our galaxy. And it's not due to uh, dust in the solar system because 
you know, out at Saturn, you're way past all that stuff. And it really should be just a clean measurement of what are galaxies, how, how bright are galaxies. And, I, you know, and, again, we're not resolving them individually. We're just asking how much light do they make. And so that's that's you just said an interesting thing, important thing, I think, is that is that we can't we can't really do this effectively if we have telescopes closer to Earth. Is that right? Because of all this dust problem and. You got it. The, all, the real motivation. All the light bouncing around uh, in the in the solar system. That's it. The the real motivation here, the reason that we've been talking about trying to do this kind of measurement for years, and, and finally Lori came along and made it happen, was that um, the from Earth, the 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 planets are sitting in a dust cloud that basically follows the same plane of the planets, and from Earth, the dust reflects the sunlight. Uh, uh, back at us, and it's bright. It's 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 much much brighter than the light from all the galaxies. So we've been trying forever and ever to do this measurement uh, uh, from Earth or from close to Earth, you know, in space. Um, and 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 the fact of the matter is that that because it's a hundred times brighter than the thing you're looking for, it means you need to understand it to one percent to get rid of it properly. And that's been a and real there, challenge. And there were proof of concepts because we have had probes that have gone out that far right so uh uh one this is this is getting a little technical but one major yeah, sorry between no no i i i i think it's great uh, uh uh one major difference between lori and everything else that's gone before is that lori has some dark pixels on it so we can understand what zero means on the detector because dark pixels you, are pixels that don't work right no, they're, they're pixels that are shaded so they don't see light. Oh, but they do work. But they do work. Okay. And so what you want to do is you want to say, the, the whole question here is when I make an image, um, with these kind of detectors, you know, for a variety of electronic reasons, zero doesn't mean zero. Zero is arbitrary. So you need to have some knowledge of like, what does zero mean for this particular detector at this particular time, and then subtract that off. So the, the sort of secret sauce here was that Lori had these dark pixels that let us do that and really understand exactly what the kind of instrument itself was doing. And so with looking at field two, which was the example you had, what is the data? Is it the, it's the blue streak, the horizontal blue, uh, light blue, or is it the dark blue? What's the light that you're... It's, it's, it's kind of the average of that blue green stuff. Okay. Wow. This is really a subtle effect. And how do you yeah. know that's not stuff in our own galaxy? Uh, how do you know this is stuff way out in other galaxies? That is a great question. And that is well, why the you. measurement is hard. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, okay. So we've got to go through the list. The list is it could be uh, light in the solar system that's getting reflected off the dust. Um and basically the way you constrain that is you know that the light from the sun is getting fainter and fainter as you go further and further out and you know roughly what the dust is doing. And so if you bring up that figure with the big green patch in it. Okay. Okay. The big green patch. Hold on. All right. So that one is showing. Okay. So on the X axis, that's distance from the sun in, in units of, uh, uh, Earth to the sun. Wait, hold on. It's got this. It says Pioneer 10 IPP photometry in the upper right. You got it. Okay. Got to make sure I have the right one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So heliocentric distance means distance from the sun and units of Earth to sun distance. So 5 AU is uh, five times the distance from Earth to sun. And it's roughly where Jupiter is. And then 10 is sort of more like where Saturn is. Um. And then on the left-hand axis, the vertical one, this is funny astronomer brightness units. I know. I the, Yeah. Yeah. So so all you need to know is that the, the bigger numbers mean brighter for this, this, this light that's getting reflected. We call it IPD light, which is uh, interplanetary dust, IPD. Okay. So um, Carol was asking before about, other instruments. It ends up that Pioneer 10, which is which is ancient by now, um, did some measurements. <laughs> it had a little camera, very big field of view, very big pixels. Um, it did a measurement and it, it, it measured the red points 
that you see on that plot. So what's happening is that this light from the from the dust is just dropping like a stone. And then we got involved with uh, 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 collaborator Andrew Poppy, who wasn't able to make it today, but he, he's like a guru about this interplanetary dust. And he has a model for how it should go. And what we did was we scaled his model, which is kind of the green line, to the, to the measurements that Pioneer did. And lo and behold, they actually kind of match. Well, and so, real bright, at real bright values, they seem to do okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then and then you kind of run out of gas, basically, and and, and also the error bars for Pioneer were were a little large, but anyway. Um, so so what's happening here is you know our best guess is that in these fields, fields one and two, field three, field four, those are the data sets we had. Um, the best guess at how bright the light from this solar stuff is is that it's pretty darn faint. So. Uh, uh, that gives us confidence that it's not some kind of solar system diffuse light. So, that, if what you were looking at were this interplanetary dust, it would yep. not be. It would be this bright, and you're not seeing that in the in the in this the the one with the four bits in it, the 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 field two, for example. Yeah, right, right, okay. and 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 in fact, it's not just that it would be this bright. It's that. Uh, even if it were this bright, it wouldn't matter for the measurement we're trying to make. We're trying to measure something that's about 10 in these units. Okay. So like you can see, by the time you get to field four, it's teeny tiny. Okay. All right. I think I get it now. Okay. I really want to get uh, Chi into this. Let me uh, get, let me, uh, let me get uh, back to her. You've got your uh, microphone muted just so you know, but welcome Chi. I would like you to tell us what your, um, what your interest and role in all of this is. Um, so what I did last year was I was in a class, which was observational astronomy. So we have to do a project for that class by the end of the semester. And Mike has those data lying around and there was a lot of data and we have to filter out the one that will actually be useful for us. So um, I ended up, um, using this as my project for that class where I just went through the data, um, pick out a one that has um, enough quality that I, we could actually look at them because some of the images were taken, um, were exposed for 10 seconds, but some of them was only exposed for like 0.1 second. So my job was to write some um, computer strip to run through the data So this is data, data you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, Point just Lori there. Boy, that's pretty fast exposure. <laughs> yeah, so those wouldn't have enough. Um, sick, um, those wouldn't have enough quality for us to actually distinguish between the stars and the background. So I was looking for data that have about ten second exposure, and then identify where the camera where Lori was pointing to on the sky. Um, identify uh, the objects. Um, like the feel of the object where the, the stars are and the locations of New Horizon at the time. So I'll just make a list of those and then we only pick out the data that um, where Laurie is looking outside, of, um, looking, uh, so you know the Milky Way is like a dish shape. Right. So right. Um, we only want the data where Laurie is looking perpendicular to the disk. How often was that uh, on its way out to, I mean, it looked all over, presumably, on, on its way to Pluto. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but it was looking like all over the place. So we have to make sure that it's not looking toward the sun, um, which doesn't happen very regularly. Um, we also have to pick out when it's not looking um, in the Milky Way, it has to look perpendicular to the disk. And that, I think, about like half, half of the points, um, half of the time that it was looking it would be looking perpendicular to the disk okay someone just joined the hangout but i can't see who it was uh robin is that right oh, okay well uh oh, i have no idea <laughs> okay, robin hi robin can you hear me i can hear them they can't hear me oh. okay. it's probably because i have i have this oh, okay. here I, it would, I, I'm not sure if she was, was she one of the uh, people that was supposed to be on? No, I don't quite know uh, what's happening. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to go ahead and, and not let that work. Okay, so okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Someone just joined the hangout. Okay, so uh, 
uh, so Chi, you were telling us about the data that you were gathering from from New Horizons. It was your job to go through this stuff, which I don't envy, by the way. <laughs> That's, I know from a person who does this or used to do this that it was a um, that's a lot of work. And so I guess what information in the images told you where New Horizons was looking? Was it something in the, like a lot of people, I, I just should give a little bit of a background. I don't know. And I don't know if this is true, but so I'm going to ask you. Astronomers use an image format, folks, called FITS. It's Flexible Image Transport System. And it was developed back in the 80s by NASA for looking at uh, astronomical images and it has a lot of other data in it. It has a header and the image and it can have a great many of these uh, header and image combinations in one image. And I was just wondering, did, is that what New Horizons used, guys, or was it another <laughs> image? <laughs> Excuse me, it wasn't totally invented by NASA. I happened to be there at the time. Well, okay, I'm that old. Like, what is it, Carol? <laughs> well, astronomers invented it, but NASA adopted it. Oh, well, right. NASA's, taking, NASA's taking credit for it. I'm yes, they do. I did notice on the Wikipedia page that they take credit for it. They did create a working group, but... They did not invent the FITS okay. well, well, what's amazing about FITS data, Just folks, what you all, I stand corrected. And of course, I'll defer to your knowledge because I definitely would, would trust that more than Wikipedia. But the, the, uh, uh, the, the thing about this data format, folks, is it has stood the test of time. It, it is, it, it, these are images that contain... We have all whole bunch of things that tell us about our data. So what, when it was taken, what instrumentation, where the camera is pointing in particular, um, the filter used, how long the time is, and even in calibration um, information. So when the data is process you get all that stuff too from the software and so uh, that, that it has been really a powerful thing because it has enabled us to we, so we that i i'm sorry for the diversion but i did want to ask you chi was that the kind of data you looked at or was it something else um yeah so that was that was the idea so um out of the um lorry data that i use have a really long header in fact, there were a lot more information than we need. So a part of the project was which parameters to use. Um, yeah, so I had to look for the documentation for to understand like, which um, keyword, what it means and what would be useful for us when we look at the data. And how long did you spend looking at this data? Um, so I guess it will be about like... Um, one to two months. Um, I can't remember exactly. Uh -huh, okay. um, yeah, so to be fair, um, I can look at one image and then write a computer strip to look at the rest, a few hundreds of them. So um, a lot of work is involved. I just write the um, few out of right parameter that I need to look for in, in each Okay, so I, I know that that ends up being some of the things that students end up doing a lot. And you did that for how long? You say a year? Um, no, just like um, one or two months. Uh -huh. It was um, part of a project for one class, so uh -huh. it didn't really take that long. Oh, okay, cool. Well, um, and so when you would... You were sometimes dropping out. And, okay, so I think we got some, a couple of bandwidth issues here suddenly... Uh, I think we're back on track, though. We might have had a little glitch on the some of the bandwidth problems here, but we seem to be back now. So hopefully, um, I still see the stream coming through, so I think we're going to be all right. Although some people have noticed that it did, it came back. Okay, good. So we are back. Yeah, sorry, I had a little bit of a bandwidth issue there, folks, but we should be okay now. And um, okay, so um, let's see. Let me uh, let me ask you guys. What, what are, how do I ask this without seeming, I don't want to seem flippant here, but I want to know what did you learn from doing this research? And I'll start with you, Michael. Oh, um, 
well, for example, did you see what you had hoped to see? Was it was there any surprises? You know what I'm getting at? Yeah. Um, let's. Okay, so I'm going to answer that real quick. If you go to the slide I sent around that has all the points on it um, and the big yellow band in the middle. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so that's that. This is a plot of our current state of knowledge of what we were trying to measure, and and so the bottom axis is wavelength, which means color, basically. And then the left axis, the vertical axis, is the brightness of this background. And you can see, you know, it's a logarithmic y-axis, meaning it's running from 1 to 100. And you can see that it's kind of a mess, and we're getting a lot of different answers. And that's been traditionally the case. And, and the reason it, it's like that is because of this interplanetary dust. Like I said, from near the Earth, you're fighting this thing you have to be able to subtract out. So what did we actually do? Is we measured that star with the, the vertical error bar there and the horizontal error bar, the horizontal band, uh, uh, the red, is, is basically the wavelength coverage of Lori. Um, and, and so the, the whole question here is uh, if I do the measurement this way where I'm just like a bucket and I'm collecting light, um, does that match the same number I expect to get from galaxies or is there more or is there less? And so the galaxies, the number of photons you would you would infer from galaxies are the open black triangles along roughly along the orange band there. So that's kind of like how bright galaxies are. Um, there had been measurements kicking around for years that are factors of a lot. You know, the green points, for example, brighter than that. So this whole question of like, are we missing a lot of light in the universe? It, it was really kind of open. And so uh, what this measurement did was we were able to put this upper limit, the red thing in the middle of the page there with the arrow pointing down. That's a that's a what we call a two sigma statistical limit, which is basically like that's our best guess for how bright this could reasonably be. So that's as bright as background optical that, photons from distant galaxies can ever get. You got it. You okay. got it. That's, that's as Lori, uh, as measured by Lori. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, unfortunately, we did not measure the actual background light, but we are able to say it's not crazy, right? It, it, it's pretty consistent with what you would expect for galaxies. There isn't like a factor of 10 more light that we're just somehow missing. Um, so, so that's reassuring. But I, I, I think that the, the, the bigger thing is that, 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 we showed that you can do this in the first place. And, and what we're doing right now is we're going back. There's much more data in the archive we didn't look at for this study that's more around Pluto. More New Horizons data, you mean? More New Horizons data. And, and what we're hoping to do is if we can chug through that data and, 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 and we're looking at it right now, like I mentioned, uh, we think that we'll be able to actually get the error bar small enough that we'll be able to kind of detect it and say, okay, it's this big. Um, and so, and so, uh, believe it or not, people kind of, you know, if you go to NASA before this measurement and said, you know, we want to do, we want to do this measurement with Lori, they would have said, yeah, but it sounds dangerous. I don't know if you're wasting our time. Um, what this did is a proof of concept that, yeah, hey, we can do it, and and here's the method to do it, and boy, we should do more of it. Well, okay, well, you use New Horizons because. It was there, you could, and it was far out in the solar system like you needed it to be. Uh, is there a better, uh, what about, well, I suppose maybe not Juno because it's, it's caught up in Jupiter's mass. But uh, are there other ways you can make this observation? I mean, if there weren't new horizons, would there be something else? Not really. Um, so it's the only the, game in town. These days, yeah. Um, you know, in the past there may have been, but you come back to this reference pixel, pixel thing I was talking about before, which is, um, that that we people just don't build the camera in the way that you'd want to do this measurement properly. So it would always be a little bit, you know, janky and, and not so good. So, so, so Lori the Lori really camera is not even ideal. Um, Lori's actually pretty good. I guess the thing that it, it's, it doesn't have working for it is that it, it's broadband. So really you'd rather be able to measure in like, specific wavelength ranges rather than one big broad thing but um and that would match and that would but what you mean is that it would match more you could measure more closely that curve that you got you're it. talking about That's exactly instead of this wide and yeah okay right. thank you right um 
Um, so, so ultimately what we want to do, having learned all this, we're going to go back, we're going to look at more data in the archive. We're going to try and get that error bar down. We'll but ultimately what we want to do is, is take over New Horizons after it's done its current mission and use it for astrophysics if NASA will let us. Use it for astrophysics. Yep. So, so, so the question, okay, so I'll tell the story of New Horizons, which is that uh, its initial mission was to go by Pluto. It did that spectacular result. Uh, they went back to NASA. They said, you know, if we deviated slightly, we could pass by what's called the Kuiper Belt object, which is like a, a giant comet type thing that that lives out in the very distant solar yeah, system. Yeah, we talked about that. Hubble helped pick one, I think. Right. Yeah, exactly. they used Hubble to to verify their targets. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So uh, uh, it's going to whiz by that thing something like 2019. Um, and, and their funding cycle, and then it takes like a year to download the data, so 2020. So after 2020, it's kind of run out of stuff to do, or at least the stuff to do is not like, you know, amazing planetary science like it was originally intended for. So one thing you can do is what Voyager has been doing for years and years, which is, you know, studying the dust and the magnetic fields in the outer solar system told us a lot of cool stuff. Um, New Horizons can do that. particles and things like that. You got it. Yeah. Um, but... There's no reason at all that we couldn't take over New Horizons for a period of, you know, a year, whatever it happens to be, to do some astrophysical stuff. And, and, and it really allows some unique measurements. Um, so, so right now, um, I'm in the process of, uh, of uh, going down to, to NASA headquarters and asking them, please, 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 would you please consider it? Can we get some money to do it? And, and hopefully they say yes. And so hang on just a sec. So that, that actually brings up a uh, question Yurik Mazano had, which, um, oh no, I'm sorry, it was Adam Synergy. Uh, could these nice people at New Horizons be persuaded to use up Jews taking lots of lorry images after the next flyby? And you're saying that what you're hoping to do is to ask for time now, right? Yep, you got it. And 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 that's exactly it. Uh, after their Kuiper Belt flyby, there's no reason that 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 we wouldn't be able to do it. And 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 uh, you're absolutely right that that the. New Horizons team is, has said they're very interested and they'd like to do it. And it's just a matter of, you know, coming up with a plan and making sure that everybody's on board. Well, it's not like there's a lot of wear and tear here. I mean, what what's New Horizons powered by? So it's not like you're taking a lot of extra power either, is it? Is it or are you? No. So New Horizons is powered by uh, radio thermal electric generators, which are kind of like nuclear power plants in space. Um, these are the things NASA uses for very distant missions. They, they, they last for a long time. So power is not the issue. Um, the thing for, for New Horizons that they wouldn't like about what we want to do is, is astronomy requires you to point around the sky. And so you have to use up propellant to do maneuvers. Right. I was wondering about pointing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there, you know, you, you, I think ultimately what you'd be limited by is the number of maneuvers that you'd be allowed to do. But because you know, it's always possible that if you move, move away from, you know, that you could not get back for, I mean, unless you do it after the Kuiper oh, Belt. Oh, would they be, they would be mad. They'd be mad. Be like, oh man, these guys really messed well, up. Well, I, I want to know if, if she is in this for the long haul or did you do your project and you're running, screaming away from Good, this. good question, Chi. <laughs> right. Um. Well, so this was an interesting learning experiment experience for me because um, my PhD um, research would actually deal with the wavelength that is slightly longer than what Laurie could observe. So if you remember in the previous plot, the one with the yellow band, um, my research would be to deal with the wavelength between um, 0.6 to 2 micron. So that would be more into the near infrared. However, the type of data that we will get would be um, pretty much also like image, and then we have to take out the stars. We have to account for all of the other stuff that are definitely not the background in order to get um, the background measurement, but in the longer wavelength. So um, some of the data points in there are called cyber. So what I'll be working on is on the second generation of cyber, which is cyber tool. And we are hoping to um, uh, reduce the, the error bar in the cyber measurement. So the so, cyber measurement is the one that's over off toward the right there. Yeah, I so guess. it's 
for um, near infrared um, background. So um, it was a really good practice for me to actually like, have a feel of um, how to analyze the data and what sorts of um, things that we are looking for and also to understand the science behind it. Good. It's, uh, well, you're digging in the noise too. So you're starting with one of the hardest <laughs> problems. So <laughs> if you yeah, know how well, to do that, you can do anything. <laughs> She, she yeah. has she has elected the way of pain, which is to choose yeah. a PhD uh, that's based on a sounding rocket, which is <laughs> wow. possibly the hardest yeah. PhD there is. Yeah. Why yeah. is that? Why is that? Because um, we we also have to build the instrument from Sharat as well. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. <laughs> good for you. So the good thing is we can build a camera that works the way we want it to work, but the difficult part is that. Um, we have to do everything. Okay, and Hans, <laughs> right. okay, let me get another question in from Hans. Uh, Hans Milling is asking, uh, New Horizons is about 38 AU from the sun, but the Kuiper Belt stretches at least nine, or at least 50 AU out. Can you redo the observations when the spacecraft clears the Kuiper Belt? Presumably, the conditions would be even better, right? Yeah, right. Um, uh I, I think the issue is more how do you fund a project that requires an army worth of people for a long time while it's doing nothing. Um, and so that's, that's not a technological issue. That's a money issue. But I, I think that's the, that's the thing that would make us want to kind of compress it. Um, the, the Kuiper belt may be very bright in dust. Frankly, we don't know. Uh, the best guess is that is not. Um, so there's no harm in doing the measurements in the Kuiper belt. And if there is harm in it, well, I guess we learned something. Um, so, you know, I, I'd love to, uh, we'll see what happens. I think you were talking about after it gets past the Kuiper belt, but it sounds like you're saying that what has to happen to keep these missions going is all of the people have to stay employed, even though there's not a whole lot going on, right? That's exactly Was that it. true on the, that wasn't, well, periodically when, on the way to Pluto, people, had to come together to, to turn things on, but the entire mission was staffed the entire nine years. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I can see that being, a yeah, problem. it's hard. You know, when people wander off and they get involved in other things, you don't, you know, if somebody goes from Hubble to somewhere else or, or works on JWST, since we're in house at one place, it might be possible, but usually they wander off and do something else interesting. And they don't want to get a phone call saying, you know, remember the thing you were doing seven years ago? Could you come back and do that again? And you're like, no, I want to get on with my life and I'm doing other research or other engineering or whatever. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's look at a couple. Uh, Larry Keese is commenting that the RTGs, the uh, uh, radio, what are they? Radioactive thermal generators. Is that right? That, yeah. Okay. Uh, are still working on Voyager, so they last a long time. That's good. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, let's does. Oh, Adam Synergy is asking. Do does the dust counter on New Horizons help constrain these results? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is basically yes. That uh, uh, that that plot we were talking about with the big green swathe, uh, uh, a lot of that is actually based on real measurements now um, that, that Andrew Poppy and, and, and his collaborators are doing. So uh, having, having those data has been really valuable, and, and, and I'm glad that it, it exists. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and Yurik Mazano is asking about uh, cosmic rays. He goes, I have a question you may have already answered, but uh, do cosmic rays become an issue that far out in the solar system? Do you guys worry about cosmic rays in these in these data? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess I guess I guess uh, the 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 question I had in mind the the idea that as you go further out, the the effect of the sun's magnetic field gets somewhat diluted, and and so you get you know you're more open to to, to cosmic rays. Um, you know, the primary way that this would be a problem is to uh, the cosmic rays come in and they hit the CCD, which is the detector that detects the light um, and, and kind of damage it. Um, and and over time, that definitely is a problem. Um, I would say that we haven't seen any appreciable 
um, uh, you know, change in the performance of the CCD between, let's say, Mars and, and, and Uranus. So, you know, yes, but I haven't seen any evidence yet, so I'm not panicking about it. Okay. And uh, Carol Van... Let's see, where, where is... Um, Carol Van, de, Van der Velden is asking, will there be significant risk in passing the Kuiper Belt? In parentheses, no, not for me. I <laughs> know, not for you. Uh, what about? What, is there any 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 significant risk in, in going through the Kuiper Belt for New Horizons? Uh, maybe everybody else can jump in, but I think I think the answer is no. Um, the Kuiper Belt is, you know, it's a belt of matter, but it's not. Um, it's, it's not, not like not the rings very, of Saturn or something where you're trying to go right straight through something exactly. super dense, right? It's pretty. It's, it's not very dense, and and you know, yeah, there's stuff in there like little sand particles that could hurt things, but uh, uh, you know, New Horizons had a glitch, right? Right, some six months or something before they went to Pluto, they, the the experiment went into some kind of full shutdown mode, right? Um, Heart stopper, scared. and and so. Uh, Obviously, things can happen, but I guess as long as they don't happen, you're fine. Okay, so yeah, I'm uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going through a few more. It looks like we had a little bit of, okay, so there was a bit of a bandwidth glitch, I guess, uh, about a half an hour ago. Sorry about that, folks. I do have streaming equipment now that keep me from getting dropped out, so it keeps streaming. I'm also recording locally on my computer, so I get the higher quality stream as well. Um, so I, it's independent of, uh, of my internet connect or anybody's internet connection for that matter. So, um, thank you guys for, for sticking with it. I appreciate that. Um, and I think, um, okay. So if you got any more questions or comments, please send them to me on the, on the chat, uh, for live chat. In the meantime, I got one for you, Chi, and that is, I want to talk a little bit about you, you, you are just starting out in your career, obviously. And I, I want to get some sense of why you chose to go into astronomy and what did you, what are your, what, what, what was your experience like? Where was it hard? Was did, was did the math get you? Uh, uh, what, tell us a little bit about your experience in being a math student or an astronomy student. Um, so I chose this career because I like astronomy, um, obviously. Um, but I guess, well, as in when I went to college for a derived degree, um, I got exposed to both um, the data analysis aspect of astronomy, um, which involved a lot of computer programming and just looking at like highly pixelated image, like what we saw earlier. <laughs> um, and I also got um, I also got some experience with building instrument as an undergraduate student, and I realized that I really like like to be in lab and actually like got to design something, build it, and then take data with it. So um, it's, it's interesting. So when um, you, it definitely, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, so when you, uh, when you were, and did you go to undergrad where you are now, or did you, or did you go somewhere else? Um, I went to the University of Arizona. Okay, so you were an undergrad there, and you studied your, your astro did you, did you study astronomy or physics? I studied astronomy. Uh, astronomy, okay, yeah, and uh, from yeah. there, uh, what was the experience like for you to go? Now, this is I'm, I'm asking this for students who may be considering this as a career move on their own. When you went from mm -hmm. going into uh, astronomy as an undergrad, you, you what factors weighed into you going? You know what? I'm going to go ahead and get a get graduate degree because when I went and got my physics degree at, at CU. I decided early on I wasn't going to go to grad school because I had a small, young family. I had some other considerations, um, but uh, I did I did okay. But I could have done better as a PhD student. What factors went into your decision to go to grad school? Um, I think curiosity is one thing um, because I feel that uh, there's so much more that I could learn um, that I didn't have time to learn when I was an undergrad. So. I want to be. Um, I want to know to feel um, much better, um, and then I also want to specialize in the um, experimental aspect. So you know, build instrument and take and take data and analyze data. I got some chances to do that as an undergraduate student, but I feel that um, it wasn't at the level that I would like. Like I just want to be to get better at that. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, and I guess I also want to find a job at a university. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, yeah I also want to go into academia. So yeah, that's pretty that's competitive cool. too. Uh, going into a university, academia. So good luck. I I hope that that works out really well for you. The the um the, what were what would you describe as some of the biggest challenges that you faced and that you still face as a student? So um, astronomy is definitely challenging. You need to learn a lot of physics and math. Um, we also have to do a lot of programming, so I have to learn many different types of languages. Like when I was an undergrad, I learned C, and now I have to learn MATLAB and Python. So it's, um, it's require a lot of learning. Um, and, well, I mean, I'm an experiment person, so when you build something, you put them together, usually they will not work the first time. You have to find a fix. Um, uh-huh. So that's also like a constant challenge with doing experiment. Well, what I like about your story is that you've chosen to go uh, a practical route. Where, and by practical, I mean <laughs> instrumentation and data instead of the theoretical part. And I'm sure Carol has something to say about this too. But I've always been advising people, if you can process data, if you can build a camera, if you can build a, or design a spacecraft, you're going to get a job probably in astronomy. We, there's a lot of theorists out there. And I think it's good to see. Oh, geez. It's good to see that we're getting. A, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Right oh, there. my gosh. Uh, <laughs> the, the, Tony's opinions are not the opinion of any of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are views held by me but, and a lot of other people, not necessarily. So I'm, not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a theorist, but um, actually I'm from the ground-based community. I work on Hubble, but I'm a, from the ground-based community and I did a lot of hanging out in the lab, calibrating it. So I wasn't an instrument builder per se, although I did participate in, sort of instrument building and commissioning on telescopes and it's great but it can be really frustrating because there you are you know you're ready to go and if you get any big telescope time in your instruments on the back end of it and it doesn't work it's pretty embarrassing so and frustrating so but uh, the, the, that being said i will say that i mean she is uh is uh among a few. It's really great to see that you want to do instrumentation and that you have the opportunity to do it because now, you know, building instruments like for Hubble or JWST is such an enterprise. It's like a business. So getting hands-on experience in the lab is like fabulous, I think. So. I couldn't agree more. Rah, and, rah. and Michael, I'd like to get your thoughts on some of these things, some of these topics too. Let's say, you know, these there, there's people like Chi out there. Uh, what advice would you have for them uh, in going into grad school or even just undergrad in astronomy? Um, I would say that um, try to get involved with research as soon as possible. Um, when you are undergrad, student um people like don't feel bad if you don't have any prior experience or if you don't think that you know the field that well because you will learn as you move along like after i i feel that i learned astronomy so much i'm doing so much better in class after i started doing research as an undergrad because um you would actually see like how people get the data how they actually come up with like um theory or test a theory like, I feel that the um, the experience would help me do so much better in classes, and it also gives me um, an idea about like how being an astronomer is like. So I could decide that oh, I actually like doing this. Um, so it's okay if you are not sure whether you like astronomy or not, and after you try like working with some data and realize oh, maybe this is not the thing for me. So that's perfectly fine too. So I guess because as an undergrad, I have. Um, I already have a taste of how like being an astronomer is kind of is like. Um, I feel that I was better prepared for graduate school. So when I started graduate school, um, the program doesn't require me to do research in my first year, so it was entirely optional on my part. So I started working on New Horizons stuff, but um, I decided that I want to do it anyway. So it also really helped with like. Um, like getting the sense of how like doing research um, feels like 
And in my first year, um, well, I'm a second year now, so I have more responsibility compared to my first year. Um, but I already know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And have you passed your comps yet? Um, is that coming yet. up? Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up. So, you're, yeah. I, 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 yeah, okay. Well, good luck with <laughs> a those. A month or so. Very good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Michael, do you, so any thoughts? Anything to add to that? Um, you know, I think I think Chi had some really good suggestions there. Um, I would also say that for me, uh, you know, if this is something you're passionate about, it's 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 definitely something to pursue and stick with it because um, you never know until you try. And 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 yeah, it's hard. And yes, we all get discouraged. But but um, you know, it's it's a great job. Frankly, and 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 uh, uh, I always tell students, I, I can teach you physics, but I can't teach you enthusiasm. So, uh, you know, go out and 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 if, if this is something you're really interested in, you know, s- stick with it and have faith. I think it's 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 a good thing. Okay, well, uh, I always get crap when I when I do my uh, little spiel on on theorists versus. Uh experimentalist so uh, adam synergy is like a spacecraft wouldn't work without theorists like, like einstein okay fair enough fair enough my only point though was that there are a lot of theorists and a lot of theories and what we really could use is data to tell us which of these theories are maybe better than okay, others stop. that's all i'm saying Stop. Well, <laughs> i hang out with my theorist friends all the time i mean we take a lot of classes together just that we on um, like some of my um electives are more about like building instrument while their electives are about solving more math yeah, right. so at some point we just um diverge into different routes but our background should um our background is similar we That's are both like, right. physicists I'm- at the end of the day yes exactly and my own in my point in this whole thing is that you know we've got an awful lot of theories it'd be nice to know which ones are the best ones and which ones are backed up by observations it's now i'm not saying it's easy to be a theorist it's not easy at all but it is certainly hard to get the right data sometimes we're only just now getting no, data from some theories I, that are and, decades and old. this is this is not to disparage professional theorists but it is it is I think this word theory is very important. I'm not really trying to bolster your point, Tony, but oh, I think people, have, <laughs> people people I mean, I think this word theory has been sort of a little abused that, you know, it's a whim or, you know, it's just a theory. No, what we consider theories in astronomy and physics is something that you put forward that has a mathematical basis, a physical basis, and it is testable. Now, you can't, it's true, we can't always test every single theory that comes out, but that's the point is that the theory is testable. And you can take evidence that will then either bolster that theory or modify it or prove that or or suggest that the theory so this word theory has been used in like the last five years as if it's kind of a whim and you can discount it no the the point of theories is to be testable and and that's what a lot of us like she like to do is Mm. test those theories good well said carol okay well i'm going to leave it with uh, larry keese who says theorists are good people too followed by (laughs) kenneth kilgore who says at least that's the theory so <laughs> all right we're gonna leave it there folks i want to thank you guys very much for watching well before i leave though real quick question so you're you're next up and next up for you michael is you're going to see about getting some more time on new horizons uh as it gets to the kuiper belt objects yeah we're gonna we're gonna go go troll put on our diving suit and troll back into the archive and see what's what's in there and we reckon that there's enough in there to to make an actual measurement this time that's, you know, come into the archive since we last looked. So, yeah, fingers crossed and talk to you in a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, well, good luck with that. I hope I hope you, I hope you're able to get more data and uh, more more uh, more results uh, to discuss, hopefully in, in future Hangouts. And um, so if you so if you wanted to get at some of this data, your, is New Horizons data on the archive, Carol? Uh, or no, is it? Is it, or where do you get New Horizons data? It's not, yeah, it's not in our archive. Oh, it's it's not, Kepler it's, data. It's, 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 on, it's on the, the planetary guys have their own archive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's not masked or anything yeah. like that. Okay. No, no, no. It's not. Uh, but it is publicly available. Data. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, so there folks. are different centers for, for different kinds of data. Got it. Okay. All right, folks. Well, that is it for this week's uh, Astro Coffee Hangout. I want to thank my guest, uh, uh, doc, Dr. Michael uh, Zemkov uh, from the Rochester Institute of Technology, also Chi Wing from uh, she's also a uh, from the Rochester Institute of Technology and is a graduate student there. These guys worked on data that from New Horizons spacecraft to look at photons or optical light in between the distant galaxies. And uh, their paper is, is your, your paper is out, correct? Yep. And what uh, what journal is it out in? It's in Nature Communications. Nature. Nature Communications. And there was, if you want something a little less technical, there was an article in Forbes magazine that's available online. Oh, nice. <laughs> ah, very good. Okay. And I will try and remember to get those uh, links up there uh, on the, in the description box so you guys can check them out as well. I didn't know them before it started. So anyway, on behalf of Carol Christian, I want to thank you all very much for watching. Uh, this is, we'll, see, we'll be back next week when we have a Footsteps to Mars Hangout where I think we're going to be talking more about the physiological aspects of traveling to Mars. Uh, with uh, We're going to continue our discussion on, uh, on some of the human abilities or human uh, uh, restrictions and, and, and consequences of being in space. So we'll be talking about that as well next time. Uh, until then, thank you all for watching. And as